Hi, I'm James McGuire, and on today's eSpeaks, we're talking about a couple of key emerging tech trends that are having a big impact on the enterprise. We're taking a look at observability and at the trend toward everything is code. To discuss that, I'm joined by a very special guest. With me is Rick McConnell, Chief Executive Officer at Dynatrace. Rick, thrilled to have you with us today. Thanks so much, James. My pleasure to be here with you. And, and, and how is your life going this week? Is this a really busy week? Or are you just happy to be Friday, happy to be at Friday? Or <laughs> what's the world of Rick McConnell this week? I think that uh, I think that every uh, every week was busy, James, but uh, especially with the end of quarter, uh, that's always a busy time for us, which uh, which ended yesterday uh, for, mm. for us. So uh, so that's uh, that obviously is uh, something that happens. And then secondly, you've got uh, you've got a little bit more airplane travel these days than it used ah, to used to be right. the case after two years of essentially uh, little to no airplane travel. I think I've been somewhere around the globe uh, each of the last six or seven weeks. So mm. it seems that uh, it seems that travel is, is again beginning to pick up. That's, that's, that's positive. Uh, all right, so if I, if, I, if I, when I think about observability, big trend, I think about intelligent software that can give an administrator an overall view of the infrastructure. I mean, th this application is performing well, you know, this server has gone down, you know, maybe we've been hacked at this endpoint. So I certainly observability has really been gaining steam over the last year or so, a couple of years. I mean, what, what, are, what are some trends that are moving observability forward? The, the biggest, uh, biggest trend by far is digital transformation and what's happening mm -hmm. very broadly. It is, this is um, obviously almost the buzzword of the day, but it really is true. You, you have companies digitally transforming and that is causing them to essentially rebuild their overall IT infrastructures into cloud ecosystems. And as they move into the cloud, the requirements for situational awareness of your infrastructure are, are um, as high as they've ever been. And the result of that is that you need to always know how your infrastructure and your applications are performing. And in so doing, that's where observability comes in in terms of its criticality to make sure that you've got all of the capabilities at your disposal to ensure comprehensive understanding of, of what's happening in that ecosystem. How do you feel that observability is in terms of its uh, adoption? Or are we really there all the way mainstream with observability or is it still on, on the cusp? I think that uh, I think that it's it's still very much uh, in early days, uh, early innings. Uh, heretofore, much of observability is still done through open source tools and cobbled together in many ways by organizations that just figure they need a dashboard, and and they they want to know what's happening in that dashboard based on their ecosystem. And and what we're finding, especially with multi-cloud, hybrid cloud growing amounts of data, not a single application, but multiple applications. Mm -hmm. All of these areas are creating an explosion in data and a, a dramatic expansion in the complexity of that data. And as you get there, it isn't enough just to be looking at dashboards. You know, you think of the old fashioned room of the network operation center of people looking at screens left, right, and center, trying to, trying to find the needle in the haystack. You need answers uh, from, that, from that data and intelligent automation that comes from it. And, and that's really where Dynatrace comes in to provide not just dashboards, not just data on glass, but really the intelligent automation to be able to respond rapidly to, uh, to issues that occur and give you a very broad sense of situational awareness at all times. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about another rising trend. Uh, everything is code. Um, we, we haven't heard quite as much about this one. You know, what, why are companies adopting everything as code? And, and what exactly is everything as code for those of us who are a couple steps behind? Sure. Well, I, uh, if I can leverage my last answer to some extent, mm -hmm. step one was dashboards. You just Good. wanted visibility. Step two is giving you precise answers based on the data in that dashboard so that it is um, immediately actionable if there is an issue. And they can be addressed rapidly. I mean, think about your, your uh, going to a website and not being able to buy a pair of sneakers or not being able to make a bank transfer or machine-to-machine -machine interactions not working. This is creating customer chaos. And people want to avoid it by getting elements and issues resolved as rapidly as possible. Step three, though, is exactly what you just described of everything is code. Because wouldn't it be a, a nirvana? Wouldn't it be a utopian world if we could essentially have code self-correct. So code- Code what, I'm sorry, what, what would you say? 
you know, if we could have code self-correct issues. Well, all right, so it, it's, it's, it's intelligent code. Exactly. So that, so that, and we think of this as shifting left, moving the observability element back into code so that effect, effectively that code can utilize information coming out of an AI ops engine, like from Dynatrace, and then uh, take precise action as to how to rectify it without needing that, uh, that network operation center. In fact, uh, Dynatrace itself runs on, and we, we ascribe to the notion of no op. Uh, no op in the sense of no operation center needed that, that directly in code, you should be able to uh, do auto remediation. And I think that is, in some sense, the holy grail here. The, the notion that software needs to work perfectly, or at least all of us as consumers want software to work perfectly. And the way to do that is never have the outage in the first place. And the way to do that is to have code, find issues, and then auto remediate. Interesting. So when I see the, the buzzword EAC or everything is code, I'm going to mentally think to myself, it's intelligent code. Does that mean that necessarily if, it, if it's EAC, does it mean necessarily that it has AI built into it or, or not necessarily? It would. No, it, it absolutely would be would be a critical requirement for you to be able to to not only have AI built into it or leveraging AI through, in, in our case, through DevOps, DevSecOps type framework but that you are, are trusting of the answers that that's giving you. Because if those answers are wrong, then your remediation in code is gonna be wrong too. So it's, it's the ability to remediate is only as good as the, as the answers that you're getting from the AI engine that's giving you those answers. Yeah, I think we're, we're, we're in this cusp period, with this transition period where almost all pieces of software are going to be built with with AI built into it. And we're going to look back at our current era and go, wow, the software back then was really dumb. We could use it, but it, it would not respond <laughs> to us in any way. Yeah, it, it's you're absolutely right. And, and in fact, this is why this is why we think of the vision in, in many ways of Dynatrace as delivering or enabling software that works perfectly. And, and that is uh, that, that's something we're clearly not at today, but but something that through intelligent AI you really can uh, get very close to delivering if that if that is giving your code the right answers to be able to do things like auto remediation as we've discussed. Mm -hmm. So, all right, Dynatrace put out a recent press release, which I'd, I'd like to, you to help me unpack. There's a lot going on here. There, there was a statement that said, quote, uh, Dynatrace, is, it's, it's delivering software intelligence, including broad and deep observability, application security, and advanced AI ops capability as code, there's a lot going on in there. So I, I we've talked about it, but could you unpack that a little bit? What, what does that mean and, and why should companies care about that? Sure. Well, uh, well, what, what differentiates Dynatrace is our ability to create precise answers, as we've been discussing, essentially from our AI ops engine uh, using traces, logs, metrics, metadata, a, a vast array of different inputs uh, from data that we ingest, we process, and then we provide very precise answers. Those answers are then enabling action, whether it's manual action on the part of an IT, IT group or automated action in the sense of code. What we want to do is we want to enable those answers to be available through APIs. And this is really where you get into DevOps and DevSecOps, that if we can provide those answers through APIs, then that makes uh, th that essentially serves as the bridge from your code to our AI engine to enable your code to then take the actions that we've been talking about. And so uh, this is a very important announcement in moving toward everything is code to enabling uh, enabling precisely uh, what we've been discussing. That's fascinating. So when, when all right, you've you've I think you've explained it, but let me clarify it a little bit for my little brain. And that there, there's a there's a connection there the, uh, in the, between Dynatrace and they say the on-prem infrastructure or it would be a cloud infrastructure. And would it, go, would it work in a multi-cloud environment? Absolutely. In fact, uh, in fact this, is, uh, this is one of the elements that, that sets Dynatrace apart in many ways is we can work within your, your managed infrastructure on, premise, on premises. We can work within your cloud ecosystem. It can be a multi-cloud ecosystem, hybrid cloud ecosystem. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what we do is we enable very rapid deployment of our capabilities that creates um, an environment that we refer to as SmartScape. And SmartScape is basically, think of it as a topological map of your entire IT infrastructure and ecosystem. 
that then enables us to have broad-based visibility as to what's happening in that ecosystem and enabling us to find further issues in that ecosystem. And, and therefore that, uh, that provides us with the, the input, if you will, to our AI ops engine, which then leads to the capability of delivering those answers that we've been discussing, whether remediated manually or in code. Interesting, all right. So, uh, and, and the key word in there, one of the very key words seems to be AI ops and that when I think about AI ops, it's, it's sort of humans acknowledging we really can't keep up with this stuff by ourselves anymore. We've created these systems. Uh, so we, we used to be able to operate, it, operate them. Now we need AI ops because we just, it's simply too complex for us humans. Um, I guess we needed to do that. Isn't it just slightly odd from a philo philosophical standpoint that we humans have created these systems that are so complex that we ourselves can't operate them without AI? Well, I think that uh, I'm, I'm not sure that I, I have a good stand on that other than other than technology <laughs> advance, advances are are moving us all forward as a community, as a society. And, it, you know, you can argue whether whether that's good, good or bad, but it, it's reality either way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that is resulting in absolutely uh, an explosion in data. And, and that data is getting more complex to process. When it was the case that I produced a single application, single mobile app that I created and delivered into the environment, uh, it was easier to manage. It was usually running either on premises where I had complete control of the of the uh, of, of deployments of new code. So maybe it was the case that I would uh, I would schedule my code release for every five weeks. Mm -hmm. And you know, I mean, if you're doing code releases every five weeks. It's not, it, it's not so it, on a single application, on-prem, not so hard. You don't have a lot of variables. Think about where we've come. We're now doing, in many cases, uh, in, in many cases, multiple deployments per day, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, in, in, sometimes multiple deployments per, per, per hour. And, and those are running not in one cloud, but multiple clouds. And, and it's, it's generating um, not just against one app, but multiple apps that are interconnected, a, a, an array of data that, that no human can really process in the way that we did a decade ago or two decades ago. Uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it's creating an inability for humans to process that. And the result is that you have to have a more intelligent AI ops engine to do it for you, because otherwise you're just not gonna be able to, uh, not gonna be able to process that information accurately. Makes perfect sense. I I, I want to ask you about the, the future, but one, one last question about this. I've heard recently someone say to me that the, the magic of artificial intelligence, the real value of it is not necessarily the algorithms, but it's the data that you feed into it. Uh, agree with that? Or do you think it's really, it's the, the algorithms are where, where it's at? I think it's a combination of the two, but if anything, the algorithms are pretty critical. Right. Uh, you know, so maybe there's a little bit of bias, but, but you are absolutely right that one data source is insufficient. Uh, we, you can't just look at logs, for example. Logs don't give you enough data all by themselves. You've got to look at traces. You've got to look at metrics. You've got to look at metadata. You've got to look at behavioral analytics. There are many aspects uh, for data that you have to ingest and process in combination with each other. And it is only that combination of that data that enables the AI ops engine to do what it's supposed to do which is to generate the value of connecting those pieces in an intelligent way. Mm -hmm. And so I would say it's, I would say it's both that, that you can't have one data source. You have to have multiple data sources and, and you've got to get beyond that one data source into, into uh, those multiple data sources to really analyze that as part of the, as part of the AI ops engine that you're using. All right. So I'd like to look to the future, get your sense of, of, of emerging tech in terms of what, what's coming in the next Oh, you know, one to three, two to four years. I mean, how will concepts like you know, EAC and observability change companies' tech infrastructure? I mean, what, what do they need to know now? I think that uh, things like uh, everything is code and observability will enable enable companies to expand and accelerate their IT ecosystem, cloud ecosystem deployments. Uh, what they're going to find is that whether it's due to regulatory, I mean, we've seen cases of financial institutions come back and, and now due to regulation, they can't use a single cloud anymore. They mm -hmm. are being mandated to use multiple clouds. You see this in Europe and elsewhere around the globe. This is creating a flood on complexity. 
And, and that is no longer going to enable companies to operate in the environments that they are accustomed to operating in. And it's going to enforce uh, through that evolution more observability required. And, and this is where not all tools, not all capabilities, not all applications, certainly not all AI ops engines are created equal. And <clears throat> it, is, uh, it, it is going to be um, incumbent on organizations to make sure that they've got the best capabilities deployed to be able to help them manage these ecosystems. And, and I would posit that the companies that get this right will have a competitive advantage in the market versus ones that don't. Mm -hmm. Which in other words, really it's at, at the bottom line, it's, it's about handling complexity. Do you have the infrastructure to, necessary to handle complexity? If you can do that, you're gonna win. If not, you're gonna be lost. I, I, think, that's, uh, I think that's well stated, exactly so. Mm -hmm. Rick, I think you said it. Uh, fascinating stuff. It's going to be an interesting sector to watch. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your expertise today. Thanks very much, James. Appreciate you having me. It was a delight to be here.